Good morning. I don't know how you follow up a worship time like that, but um, we'll certainly try. It's good to be back here. It's good to be back with you guys today. Um, I've been gone a little bit. I've been uh, with lots of different places. Um, preaching and then just being able to go home and spend some time with some family for Easter and um, just other celebrations. But, um, but it's good to be here today. And like I said, it just proves once again this church, the love and the, the amount of complete fullness you guys have behind just one member of this church that just continually amazes me. That when one person feels a need, you guys just completely come behind that person and just lift that person up. So today, um, I just want you to take a, th- take a minute and think about your morning routine. Think about what it is you do when you wake up. Do you roll out of bed, put some clothes on, and go to class like myself? Or do you have a particular set of things that you do every day? Or maybe another illustration would be better. Think about you just ran as long as you could for as long as it took you which I'm soon realizing that isn't as long as it used to be, chasing around these kids with epic ministries. I just, just can't run as long as I can. But think about that. What are you feeling? Are you feeling fatigue? Body ache? I think that in both illustrations, there's a common denominator. There's a feeling that you're feeling in both of them that you would say, comes alive when you do those, both of those actions. The common denominator, I think, is, is that after both of those actions, after both of those sensations, you are left thirsty. Thirsting for a liquid to refill your body. Thirsting for something to fill you back up. When you, when you sleep for as long as you do, whether it's four hours or eight hours or even 12 hours, as some people can sleep, you, your body wakes up with this state of dehydration that wasn't being hydrated for eight or so hours. When you wake up, your body needs to be rehydrated. When you run as long as you could, when you exert yourself physically, your body sweats, and you need to rehydrate that water. Our body tells us that we need to rehydrate ourselves. Our, some say that our body is 75% water. So there's a steady thirst to have to keep that going. Our body needs water. 75% of us are water. 75% of us is a liquid that we thirst. And our body has this strange way of telling us, hey, you need some water. Hey, you need to rehydrate yourself. But what about our, our spiritual our spiritual body, our spiritual self. Does it have a natural tendency to know when you aren't as spiritually hydrated as you should be? Does our body have a spiritual tendency to thirst? See, when Jesus was on earth, when Jesus was around us, he talked a lot about thirsting, this living water, and that he was the one that could give us this living water. This Holy Spirit that we just acknowledged a few minutes ago. This thirsting for something more than what it is we have here. Jesus talked a lot about this thirsting. Kind of like a principle I talked about last time I was here. That we thirst for God just like we fear God. We thirst for God today. We are all in in ourselves thirsty for something. We're all thirsting for something in our lives. And Jesus is the one that fills us up. So if you'd like to today, um, I'm definitely open to 1 John. That's embarrassing. But um, if you'd like to today, I had, the scripture reading is from John chapter 4. And um, it's just the story of the Samaritan woman. We've talked about it probably many times. The story of Jesus has this encounter with a Samaritan woman. But I think for us today that it will bring us hopefully a new understanding of what it means to thirst for God and how we can be better people thirsting for him daily. So if you'd like to, John chapter 4, it says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, 
but his disciples. So he left Judea and once, went once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, named that near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, uh, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will be, a, be in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to them, Sir, give me this water so I don't have to be thirsty. I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, is you have had five husbands, and the man you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, wor ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus said, believe me, a time is coming that we will not worship neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and it has come now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the Spirit, and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers fathers seek. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know a Messiah called Jesus, or called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. So we see Jesus has an interaction with a woman. Jesus has an interaction with with a, someone that, like many times in his life, it seems like no sense for him to have an interaction with. We see that Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman at a time in which is rather interesting. A time in which Jesus is by himself. This woman comes at an unparticular time to a well. Like a daily routine to draw water, and they have this interaction. This interaction that seems to give us an idea of what it means to thirst. An idea of talking about this living water. I think for us today there are three things that if we better understood from this story would help us to understand what it means to truly thirst for God. What it means to truly be filled with that living water. The first thing is, is I think it's rather interesting what the woman, what the Samaritan woman does. When Jesus is sitting there and she arrives and she's starting to go through her routine of probably filling her bucket and getting her daily water for the day, Jesus asks her this simple question, will you give me a drink? And she responds, despite the many particular things that go along with this situation. See, we all know that Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. It's even in parentheses in my Bible. It says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So there's always that tendency that, well, that's a Jew, and this is a Samaritan. What do I do? But we see that she responds. But it's also a little interesting, too, to notice that in some of the research I did, that it was very unusual for a, a Jewish rabbi to talk to a woman when her husband wasn't around. It was very unusual for that to happen. But we see that she responds. See, I think the first interesting thing for us to better thirst for God is to acknowledge that we have to respond to our thirst. Think about the normal 
thirsting for water. When I were to run or when I were to wake up in the morning, like I've said earlier, our body has this natural tendency to thirst. Our body has this natural way of telling us that we need to respond. Our body tells us that it is in need of a filling. It is in need of a thirst. So the first thing that our bodies, and the first thing that the Samaritan woman does is she responds to that thirst. Whether it is responding by getting up and saying, okay, I have to find something. Whether it's responding and saying, okay, I'm thirsty. See, the same thing applies to our spiritual filling. There's times in our life in which we go about our lives and we feel, in a sense, almost spiritually dry. There's times in our life when we don't feel as filled up. Our tank is getting empty. And it's our responsibility as Christians. It's our purpose for us to know and respond and to do something about it. See, thirsting for God, in, in part, is knowing ourselves and knowing that we have to do something to continually thirst for God. We have to do something to continually be filled with the Spirit, be filled with that living water. So we see that when the woman was approached, when the Samaritan woman was approached by Jesus, she responds. And when she starts to respond, the conversation keeps going. And you see that the next thing that she does that is crucial for us understanding what it means to thirst for God, is she starts to evaluate. She starts to evaluate what it is Jesus is telling her, what it is Jesus is offering her. And she starts to start thinking about what it is and what her own self has to do with this. We see that Jesus starts talking to her about this living water. And at first she's like, well, this sounds great. This sounds great. I would never have to come back here, never have to come and get this water that I rely on daily. Because I would have this living water that doesn't mean I don't thirst anymore. See, we start to evaluate what it is that's going on. We start to ask questions. We start to look for what it is that's going to fill us. And when Jesus offers this living water to her, she starts doing a little bit of self-evaluation. See, we know by the story that when it says at the noon hour, that's not when someone went to go to the well. That's not when the normal Samaritan or normal Jew went to go draw their water for the day. That would mean that she was trying to avoid someone. She was trying to go at a time in which no one would be there. Because she knew that when she evaluated herself and when others evaluated her, that they would see something that was to be embarrassed about or something that she wasn't too proud of. That when she evaluated herself every morning, she knew that if she would have went at the normal 8 o'clock or early morning hour to the well, the people would have said, oh, that's that, that's that Samaritan woman. That's that Samaritan woman that has had five husbands. That is that Samaritan woman that does this or this or this. But she chooses to go at the noon o'clock hour. She goes at 12 in the afternoon to avoid that. She knows that in her life she has circumstances that she's not too proud of. And she knows that if Jesus were to give her this living water, she would not have to go to this well anymore. She wouldn't have to bear the embarrassment of going at noon by herself to get her daily need, to have this thirst to be filled. See, we do that ourselves just as much as the Samaritan woman does. We have things in our life that we would just plum, rather, avoid. We have things in our life that we would just, if we could avoid that, if we could be filled with something else, then we would do that. If we could be filled with this living water and avoid what it is that others would think about us, we would do that. But we see also that in our spiritual life, we have to evaluate what it is that we are going to allow to fill us up. We have to evaluate where it is we're going to be filled up. See, in the world we live in today, there's lots of different places 
that offer this quick fix, that offer this quick fix to get us going back how we would want to be, to live the perfect life in which we all strive to have. So when we feel spiritually dry and we respond, when we are thirsting for God, we respond to our need to be filled spiritually. And then we start to evaluate where it is and what different aspects of our life that we need to be filled in. For the Samaritan woman, it was this aspect of feeling of embarrassment. For this aspect of having to avoid others. That is what she evaluated and decided that if she was going to do something about it, if she was going to be filled, it was going to be in that aspect of her life. See, I think we all have that, and I think we all know that the place in which we should and can be filled is this building right here. This is the place that offers the most effective filling for us today. This place that offers a spiritual wellness, a spiritual community, a spiritual love, and that this is the place that we evaluate and decide should be the place that fills us. So she responds to her need, to her body's natural desire. And then she evaluates what it is that she needs to fill and what it is she's going to get to fill it. And then we see towards the end of the story that she followed through. That once she has this encounter with Jesus, once she has this encounter and is filled with this living water, this time in her life has changed that she is filled and so overwhelmingly filled that we see in the next couple of verses that I didn't read that she, she goes and she tells someone, everyone in this town, that someone has told me everything about me. And she's so overly full, overwhelmingly full, that she can't keep it to herself. That when we are actively thirsting and responding and evaluating and being filled, that overwhelmingly we would pour in to others. See, she no longer has this feeling of emptiness, this feeling of embarrassment, or this feeling of unsure. Because she knows that she's been filled. She's had this interaction with Jesus. And she knows that it no longer has to feel that way. She no longer has to avoid that circumstance of going to the well. Because she is filled with something greater. She is thirsting for God. She went to the well thirsty, and she left being filled. So for us today, I think the fact of the matter for us is that as we thirst for water every day of our life, as we wake up and know that as our body's natural tendency is we have to be filled with water. It is also our spiritual, our Christian view is that we daily need to be filled with the living water. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled and thirst for God daily. See, we as Christians have this opportunity, we as people in the United States of America have this opportunity to wake up every morning and say, you know what? Today I'm going to thirst for God. Today I'm going to respond to my spiritual thirst. I'm going to evaluate what it is I need to thirst for and how I'm going to get it. And then we follow through and it overflows within us today. I think that a lot like this principle of fearing God that I talked about last time. These basic principles of fearing God and thirsting for God are things that God has put upon my heart. Not that this is something that, of course I should preach about it, but it's stuff that I deal with daily as well. And I hope that's you today. I hope that you take a chance and evaluate your life. And you respond to anything that you feel you need to thirst for. And you choose the living water. Choose the place in which you know will fill you 
the most and will leave you the most full. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that you are the one who fills us. We know that daily you are the one who creates us. Daily you are the one who gives us the circumstances that we are dealt with. And then no matter the circumstances, no matter where we are or where we may be, that you actively want us to thirst for you. You actively want us to respond and evaluate and choose you and allow that choice to overflow within us today. Lord, I pray that this thirsting for God, this idea of daily choosing you in our life, daily choosing to follow you, daily choosing to make you a part of our life just as much as our natural thirst of water is. That, Lord, you are the one who fills us, and we need filled today just as much as we needed filled yesterday and tomorrow. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for your Holy Spirit and the presence that is regularly in this church, Lord. I pray that whoever it is that needs filled would be filled today. And we wouldn't leave here the same. With your love and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.